What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of BookTube. I'm your host, Mr. Hamid. Thank you so much for coming back to my classroom. It's always a pleasure to have you here listen to me talk about books. Today, I have something that's different from what I normally would read. On the show, I have covered a lot of black authors. I've done a lot of things about representation, but given the current state of our country and everything that's happening and what's been coming out of the woodwork with this anger and rage and bigotry, I thought it would be good to try to check out a different perspective. And for that, I have found Copperhead by Alexi Zentner. What I found so interesting about this book is it's not just about race, even more so, it covers poverty. Um, and while that can be tied to race, uh, I think what this book is saying and what the author wants to point out is that there are a ton of people in our country right now who suffer from poverty and they feel as though they are being left out and unspoken to. Now, that does not mean that I condone anything that happens in this book or that I agree with any of the characters. But what it did was it put me in a position just to think differently about what I've heard and what a potential solution could be. Copperhead follows the 17-year-old Jessup. He is 17 years old. He's great at football, plays like the linebacker position or something. Uh, he also wrestles and runs track. And he's a straight-A student in all AP classes. The kid is working his tail off to get a scholarship so he can escape the poverty and the title, I don't want to offend anyone, but what they fear in the book the whole time is being called white trash, simply because of, you know, where they live, how they dress, and, you know, their level of education, and, you know, just what they have. Um, the pressures he feel uh, are really real, and what sucks is that even though he tries his best to make something of himself, he's, throughout the whole book, constantly pulled down by the decisions of his stepfather and his brother. Um, how can I get into this without spoilers? I'm not too sure. So be careful as you move forward to listen. Maybe listen to everything, maybe not. But um, he comes from a family of white supremacists. I'm telling you, this guy is different. Dr. Sweeney? This guy's unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's, I've never had a teacher like this. He's got like two PhDs. I don't know what he's doing teaching in our school. He's not like other teachers. What's he got you reading? He got this essay exam on this book, Native Son. All in this one book. Native Son? What's that? I don't know that. That's a big surprise. <laughs> so what is it? What is this Native Son? What is it? I think it's like this, it's like this book about this black guy, you know? It's, it's, we're doing this whole black literature, you know? What is it? Black History Month? No, it's just like... This guy Sweeney, you know, it's part of the course now. Yeah. What? Nothing, it's just, you know, it's everywhere I look now. What? This affirmative blackchin. I mean, a few new books doesn't qualify as affirmative black action. Hey, read the book, ace the guy's test. Just don't swallow everything you feed your whole. You know, just because you see it on the evening news. You know, but like what? All this stuff about making everything equal, it's not that simple. Look, now you got this book, Native Son. You know, what happened to the other books in the course? They're not any good anymore because Mr. Two PhD says they are? <laughs> huh? I mean, you gotta trade in great books for black books? Does that make sense? Huh? You gotta question these things, Dare. You gotta look at the whole picture. You know, we're talking about books here. But I'm also talking about my job. I got two black guys on my squad now who got their job over a couple of white guys who actually scored higher in the test. Does that make sense? Huh? Yeah, sure, everything's equal now. But I got two guys watching my back, responsible for my life, who aren't as good as two other guys. You only got the job because they were black, not because they were the best. That, that sucks. Yeah, is that what America's about? No, America's about Best man for the job. You do your best, you get the job. You know, this affirmative action crap. They go to a church 
in Puerto Rico called the Blessed Church of White America. And uh, they have like tattoos of flaming crosses and 88s and SWAT stickers. And um, he has never associated with that. But when his brother and his stepfather get caught up in a situation of self-defense, uh, it's labeled as a hate crime and the news is all over it. Um, and I felt so many things about this because, I mean, I'm a, I'm a black male and if I saw someone with those tattoos or speaking recklessly like that, if I'm being honest, I'm not too sure how I would react. But looking at this book, reading this book, it made me ask myself like, you know, maybe the answer is, isn't to react in anger, but to have, you know, some kind of questions or to create a dialogue. But then again, how can you speak to someone? How can you connect to someone who sees you as so inferior that they're unwilling to hear you at all? They just believe what has been taught to them. They just have these preconceived notions. They just gobble everything up from the media um, and they perpetuate that hatred. So. It is, it's a hard situation, man. Um, and what's really tough, without giving too much away, I know I say that in a lot of episodes, uh, is that Jessup uh, is involved in an accident that he really, I felt so bad for the kid because he was doing everything right to get away from his family's past and to make his future work. Um, and he just got in a really bad situation. And I really wanted him to get away with it. Oh, oh, I hate admitting that. I hate admitting that, but I was wrestling with it the whole time. Uh, you know, until um, he starts making some very questionable decisions. And then I was like, Jessa, man, you gotta stand for what you believe in. Some way, somehow, because you can't have your foot on both sides. And that's really what this book is about. And man, it's, I would love to teach it. I would love to give it to a number of students. I know a few people who could benefit from this, but you know, you run the risk of assigning this to a kid or a person and them thinking like, oh, you must think I'm racist because you asked me to read this and you wanna to talk to me about it. But that's not the case, man. It's just, you know, the media is overflowing with so many different stories and we don't take the time to sit down and digest anything anymore. It's one thing after another. It's hard to care about things. It's hard to keep track about things simply because we know so much and, um, you know, because of technology. But that doesn't excuse us from solving the issues that we have that are before us right now. We need to do something. And I think this book is a good start. Now, as I may have already mentioned, this book was kind of a tough read for me simply because I don't identify with too many people in the book. I mean, even the ones that, uh, even the students of color who are in the book uh, and the adults of color in the town who are in the book, um, because this is written from Jessup's perspective, they all seem so unreasonably mean um, and judgmental. But with the situation that Jessup found himself in, it would be difficult for those people living around him to acknowledge that that wasn't him this whole time. And you know, the thing is, is that he never made a clear distinction that he wasn't a white supremacist other than by not going to the churches and the rallies and stuff like that. So it's, it's not enough to be quiet. It's not enough to, to simply not participate. It's almost like you have to go all the way in the opposite direction when you're in something like this because otherwise you're just benefiting from the systems that are in place or you're just moving with the flow and that's pretty bad. Um, Zentner does a lot in this book and other than that, other reasons why it was difficult for me to read is like the first hundred pages is all football, very technical. I mean, football is interesting, but like, I didn't want to read about it for a hundred pages, but it did give me a lot to think about and it really laid the groundwork for who Jessup was to be on the field in the cold during the snow hitting guys mad hard 
uh, just doing what he can to put himself in a leadership role, but doing it so silently. And it was very much, uh, you know, like a metaphor or foreshadowing of what he would do later on in the book and what he would need to do to change so he could become the person that he said he was, or at least wanted to be. And sad things happen, man. A, a lot of sad things happen. Uh, and it just really made me think about what happened in Charlottesville. It really made me think about some of the things that have been said in the news. It really made me think about some of the things that had happened where I live and where I teach. Um, and it was tough. It was just tough facing all this stuff. A lot of Copperhead made me think about the racial commentator Tim Watts. The elite in the colonies realized that they had to figure out a way to get the f other folks from Europe on their team. So they created this mentality that said, you're now a member of the white race. You're on our team. You're, you're wearing our uniform. Now you're at the end of the bench. You may not get in the game, but you're on our team, you see. So then they start putting white folks now called on the slave patrols, right? Didn't really give them any land or any real power except the power to control people of color, which is why folks of color say, and they are right, that modern policing traces to the system of slave patrols and slavery. And we have to be clear on that because that's the history. Right? So whiteness was created to divide and conquer, to create the notion that even though you might not have much, at least you're not black, at least you're not indigenous, at least you're not Mexican, at least you're not Chinese working on the railroads to build the transcontinental economy. You may not have much, but at least you have, as W.E.B. Du Bois said, the psychological wage of whiteness. And it's a trick that was played during the Civil War era on my people in the South, right? Rich folk, landowners in the South telling poor white folks who didn't own anything that they got to go out and fight to preserve the rich man's property in human beings. Fascinating. Why would you do that? Why would I go fight for your property? Well, because you told me that if I don't, these slaves are going to take my job. No fool, they got your job. That's the point. If you got to charge a dollar a day and you can make them work for free because you own them, guess who got the gig, Jack? Not you. So in fact, the system of enslavement was in the long run against the class interest of working class white folks, but they got suckered. Same thing happened in the union movement. You had white labor union folks who didn't want black and brown bodies in their union because it would reduce the professionalism of the craft. No fool, it'll double the size of your union. And then when you go out on strike, then when you go out on strike, they can't replace your happy ass with the brown folk that you didn't want next to you in the first place. Because when they do replace you with them, then you will blame them, not the elite. See how that works? It's a trick. And the way that he explained how race is a factor in the battle of the haves and haves not, it just, it, that is why there's so many frustrations in this book for the white characters. Uh, it's why so many people are angry because you know, in politics, it's when you get hit with the numbers and the legislations and all the lingo, uh, it's like circles are being ran around. You're being talked down to. And um, and I can understand why people would feel so strongly to support someone who uses language that they can grasp and that they can relate to and repeat and understand. And um, dude, that's unfortunate. Uh, what I will say about Zentner's writing, I mean, the more I read, the more authors I read, you know, black authors, white authors, guys, ladies, um, yeah, some of his stuff is graphic. There are a couple of sex scenes and it's like, it's very much from the perspective of a dude. And, um, and then Jessup is just so short with his words and everyone around him, his stepdad, uh, his little sister even, they're just, he captured how they sound, but I would have enjoyed more dialogue, but understanding that this book is intentionally putting you in a position to, well, for me at least, intentionally putting me in a position to be in someone's shoes who was very different from me. Um, so I pushed through it and, uh, and it was meaningful. See, one of the real issues that we're experiencing now, other than just this hatred, is that now that everyone has a platform, now that everyone has a way to say something that is important to them and get it to like-minded people, everyone's talking and no one's listening. And that's tough because obviously everyone wants to be heard and they deserve to be heard, but we're not gonna get anywhere by just simply yelling over each other. 
So thank you, Alexi Zentner, for writing this book and for introducing us to the character of Jessa because I think we need it right now. So moving on, I've already said a lot. Um, man, I want to recommend this book to everyone, but I just can't. Similar to when I reviewed Ta-Nehisi Coates' Between the World and Me, is that you need to come into this with a certain mindset. If you don't come in with a certain mindset, you're gonna be, you're not gonna finish the book. <laughs> you're gonna be upset with the author. You're gonna be upset with the characters. And um, you know, you, you, you gotta be brave and you gotta be bold to get into this. So if you want, Copperhead is something that you should read if you're ready, if you wanna tackle what's actually happening, if you wanna to try to help in finding and moving forward with the solution.